Kids don't maximize their potential by being continually pressured. They're more likely to burn out than to, than to shine brightly. I'm Mackenzie Price and welcome to Gifted Minds Beyond the Classroom. Have you ever heard yourself say to your child, you're capable of so much more, bees are not acceptable, or in order to get into a great college, you need to take the hardest courses and do well in them. Or what about this one? You are so smart, you're gonna do huge things in life. You may not realize it, but lines like that make our kids feel like we're taking a 100 pound weight and throwing it around their necks. My guest today is Dr. William Stixard. He's a clinical neuropsychologist and faculty member at both the Children's National Medical Center and at George Washington University School of Medicine. He's also an author of multiple books, including What Do You Say? How to Talk with Kids to Build Stress Tolerance, Motivation, and a Happy Home. I'm obsessed with his books. If you haven't watched episode one where I interviewed his co-author, Ned Johnson, go check it out. Dr. Sixrude and I talk about communicating healthy expectations to our kids. And I'll give you a hint. It starts with actually having healthy expectations, which a lot of parents can sometimes lose sight of. This is especially true for gifted children. So I am excited for you to hear what he has to say. And at the end of the episode, I'll give you three takeaways that'll help you crush this parenting thing. So check it out as we go beyond the classroom. Dr. Sixrud, I am so happy that you're here to join me today. Thanks for coming. It's a pleasure to be here. So I talked to a lot of parents of gifted children who are just so excited about what they see in their kids and the potential. But in your book, it's called, What Do You Say? How to Talk with Kids to Build Motivation, Stress Tolerance, and a Happy Home. You talk about how parents' excitement can turn into expectations. And then these expectations can either be healthy or they can be a little bit toxic. And our challenge as parents is that we wanna communicate healthy expectations, not toxic ones. Can you talk to us a little bit more about what you mean? Sure. Well, first let me say that from my point of view and the point of view of my co-author, Ned Johnson, the two most important things we can do for, for our kids as parents are number one, help them feel that they're deeply loved, meaning they're loved unconditionally, that they're loved no matter what they do or say or no matter what they achieve, no matter how hard they try, no matter how, how many mistakes they make. Being loved unconditionally is the key to developing a close relationship with the parent. And research suggests that having a close relationship with a parent is the nearest thing you can get to a silver bullet protecting kids from emotional problems. So that's the first thing. The second thing we can do is to help them develop a healthy sense of control over their own lives. A healthy sense of control is absolutely the key to mental health. And also, a sense of control or autonomy is the key to healthy self-motivation. The kind of mo motivation where kids, are, are, they want to develop themselves. They, they want to get good at things so that they have something useful to offer this world, as opposed to being obsessively driven or the feeling of just jumping through hoops. So the, 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 those are the two things, being loved unconditionally and this uh, promoting a sense of control. And some of your listeners may know the research of Robert Rosenthal at Harvard in, in the late 1960s, who went into classrooms and told teachers that next year, uh, the kids in your class are gonna be the, the, the smartest kids in their grade. And at the end of the year, these kids' achievement was off the charts and the teachers were later told that the kids were actually uh, selected at random. Wow. And it was the teacher's expectations that the kids were smart, that they could achieve. It wasn't pressure. It was expectation. Expectations are really powerful. Now, they can be toxic and they can be healthy. And the healthy kind communicate, I believe you can. I have confidence in you. The more toxic kind communicate, you must or I'll be disappointed in you, or I'll use pressure to try to force you to do better. So I think when you talk about this toxic expectation, parents' initial reaction is like, oh, I don't do that with my kids. But I think it's actually a lot more common than we realize uh, because we don't necessarily recognize what are the aspects of our language or these expectations we have that make them feel toxic to our kids. Can you talk a little more about that? So by my way of thinking, you know, th this toxic, toxic expectations are toxic for four reasons. And the first is that 
they communicate conditional love and approval. And by doing so, you, know, you, you really deprive kids of that close relationship with the parent, a, re a really close relationship with the parent, because kids stop bringing their problems to you. They don't want to disappoint you. They're, they're less honest with you. And the second reason is that they're by definition controlling or coercive and thereby limit kids' sense of control. And the third is that they communicate excessive pressure to excel. And a lot of research has, has concluded that really bright kids in high achieving schools for, from well-off families are at such high risk for anxiety disorders and depression and substance use disorders is, is this excessive pressure to excel, this chronic pressure to excel. And the fourth thing is that it's just inconsistent with reality. The reality is that kids get this idea with these toxic expectations that there's one path to happiness and it's this kind of progressive climb straight up and it's not real. I mean, so many people in this world were not good students, didn't go to elite college, flunked out of college. I flunked out of graduate school the first time I went. It's the best possible thing that could have happened to me, but, but by the way, but, but that when kids know that there's so many ways, that, at least in America, that you can become successful, you can develop a fulfilling life, it motivates them, it motivates them to work hard. And I just had lunch with a friend of mine recently who told me that her son graduated um, from uh, a really high achieving public high school in Northern Virginia recently. He graduated, graduated with a 1.67 grade point average. So he figured I got no college options. So he went, he went to the Navy and they put him on a boat and they, they taught him skills and he learned really fast and they could tell he's smart. So they gave him more and more responsibility and he was really responsible. And the Admiral came to love him. And so after a couple of years in the boat, the kid thought, well, I'd like to go to college. So he takes, takes the SAT on the boat, has a letter from the Admiral. He's a fourth year student at Harvard now. And he graduated from high school with a 1.67 grade point average. So in my experience, when kids have this kind of more expanded sense of the, the, the multitude of ways that you can be successful and, and, and create a successful, meaningful life, it motivates them to work hard. It motivates them to work hard because the kids want to see a path. And so often when kids have these toxic, toxic expectations, the path seems bleak. Is this all there is? What you're saying is so important to understand. I remember when I was in high school, I got a job at an interior design firm and I thought, oh, this could be kind of a fun career for me to have. And I had a mentor in my life who told me, oh, you want to make sure you're doing something really big with your intelligence. So you've got to be extra careful about what you choose to do. And I remember kind of having this moment of like, wow, I guess I got to go do something huge. And that's sort of stuck with me throughout my life. It's yeah. been this like monkey on my back of like, am I doing enough? Yeah. And I think it's, you know, a challenge that we don't want to put that on our kids. Well, I think that's right. And, and I, I used to do a lot of psychotherapy in addition to neuropsychology. And I was struck by how often I'd sit down with a 35-year-old or a 40-year-old in the first session and say, how can I help? And they'd say, I feel like I've spent the first 35 or 40 years of my life trying to live up to other people's expectations. Now I'm trying to figure out what's important to me. I know all kinds of adults who are very successful from a career point of view, from a financial point of view, who simply aren't happy. And I just love the, for me, I started to think you know, that, that a successful life is a life that you're happy with. And so let me, let me say a couple things about the idea of potential, is that kids don't maximize their potential by being continually pressured. They're more likely to burn out than to, than to shine brightly. And the second thing is that a lot of kids, a lot of gifted students, a lot of bright kids, they know they're really smart and they feel this tremendous pressure to achieve um, so that they can live up their potential. And about five years ago, I tested this girl who was, she's brilliant. She's an 11th grade student. She has ADHD and an anxiety disorder. So her academic achievement was pretty, pretty uneven. And every time she didn't get an A or an A plus, she felt like she's letting herself down, her parents down, her teachers down. And, and I said, it feels to me from what you're saying that you feel, you feel that, that, that your potential like a hundred pound weight. And she said every day. So I said, ask yourself two questions. One is, how can I use my talents to do good in this world? And the second is, if there's a reason I'm here, what might my purpose be? Because I, I want kids to feel, and, and their parents to feel, that being smart is a gift. It's not a burden. 
Those are such incredibly great deep questions that every person should be asking themselves. You know, what can I do and what's my purpose in the world and what's going to make me happy and contribute yeah. in a great kids way. Like, kids like thinking about that stuff too. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some advice on how we can talk to our kids to figure out if they have these expectations that they feel are weighing them down? One possible way to start, you know, would, would be to say, I heard the psychologist talking uh, about expectations. And he's saying that, that expectations can be healthy or toxic. And the last thing I want to do is make you feel stress and pressure. And if I've been doing that, I'm sorry. And I'll say here that when you apologize to a kid, it's one of the best ways to make them feel loved and deeply respected. Um, yeah, it's, it's really powerful. Now, what happens a lot of times, Mackenzie, is, is that kids will tell me, I feel tremendous parents pressure from my parents. And the parents say, I tell them all the time. I don't care about that, that much about their grades. I don't care where they go to college. And the kids have internalized this pressure oftentimes from other sources. And what I like the schools and their peers. And what I suggest is that if a kid feels that you're pressuring, that it's getting these toxic expectations from you, and you don't feel you're sending those messages, don't try to talk the kid out of it necessarily. Validate their feelings by saying, I can see why you'd feel that way, why, why that would be so stressful for you. And then say, I see it a little differently. Can I run it by you? So that's what I think. I, I think that we can just ha talk openly about them and get their sense. Of, Am I pressuring you? Or do you feel it? Is it, is it real? Okay. Those are conversations I need to um, definitely sit down and have with my daughters. Key point when they're in a good mood and willing to do that. That's an important point to mention. <laughs> It's true. It's so much of my, my work is trying to get buy-in. You know, so I'll, I'll say things like, uh, can I run this idea by you? Or uh, for whatever it's worth, or, I wonder what would happen if you like that, as opposed to try to give advice or try to ram advice or, 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 um, or my wisdom uh, down people's throats. What can parents do day to day to help their kids develop a healthy mindset? The first thing, in my opinion, is to remember that it's really the kid's life. It makes sense for us to be thinking of ourselves more as consultants to our kids than as their, than their boss or their manager or the homework police. And as a consultant, our role is to help kids figure out who they want to be and to create the kind of life they want. And, and ultimately, to be able to run their own life before they leave home. And we see so many kids who get into most elite colleges and they just can't handle it emotionally because they don't have enough experience running their own life. And so part of your role as a consultant would be to offer help and advice, not try to force it down kids' throats, to encourage kids to make their own decisions and express confidence. I think the best message you can give a teenager besides I love you is I'm confident in your ability to make decisions about your own life and to learn from your mistakes. Secondly, is I mean, I, many, so I'm sure uh, many of your listeners know Carol Dweck's idea of a growth mindset. Versus, versus a fixed mindset. And the growth mindset is that the confidence that I, I get better through my own efforts. And I, I like that idea. And, and, and Dr. Dweck says, we shouldn't tell kids that they're smart because it, then it gets them to focus too much on their own, their own ability. And I think, I, I personally see a lot of kids who think they're stupid. And, and so, and I tell them, you're smart enough. You're smart enough to do something really interesting and important in this world. And I don't want kids to over-identify with their intelligence, but I want them, as I said earlier, I want them to see it as a gift. And, and third thing is to pay attention, encourage kids to pay attention to what they really love to do. Um, and, and as they get older, I want them to be paying attention to what comes naturally to them, what they, what they like to work hard at, but also what they just love to do, because it's that, that confluence of those two things that really gives you a sense of what do I want to study and, and what, how do I want to contribute to this world. Being a brain surgeon or a, or a physicist uh, or an investment banker, it's not bit better than being a social worker or being a teacher or an electrician. I love what you said. I uh, just had a really close friend pass away who was a social worker, and I think he did more good for this world in his short time here than you know, some of the most brilliant, talented people I've ever you know, met before. Uh, I think that's such a great, great point yeah. that we have to remember um, that there's a lot of ways to make a mark on the world. Well, it's true. It's true. And the third, fourth thing is that um, model a healthy mindset regarding mistakes. Many bright kids uh, develop are, are prone to perfectionism 
and and just letting kids know and when you screw up let them know i really screwed this thing up and let them know how, how you grow from it how, how you learn from it and and the, the last thing is to try to is to minimize the extent to which you try to use fear to, to motivate kids you know if, if you, you better get this together you know you'll never be able to do that uh you know that if you, if you don't get those grades up you, you won't be able to get, go to college that kind of thing because fear is a really good short-term motivator but it's a terrible long-term motivator um, so those are a few thoughts about developing a healthy mindset so dr sixard i think there's an elephant in the room here when we're talking about this idea of healthy expectations and um, this is kind of turning into a therapy session for me because i mentioned <laughs> that i've had this monkey on my back all my life i think a lot of gifted kids have parents who maybe struggle with healthy expectations for themselves. You know, I've always kind of had this, like, am I doing enough with my career? Am I doing enough with my Stanford degree? Um, and this is a challenge for a lot of parents. Um, there's so many great benefits that come with being smart, but these kind of continue on. So help us understand what can we do to like model this idea of healthy expectations for our kids and ourselves. You know, when I was in graduate school, Mackenzie, I, I, I was, um, I did. I studied at the Institute of Child Development in Minnesota. They had a world class um, child development specialist there, scientists. And I talk. I remember talking to some of them and feeling just inferior. They're so much smarter than I am, uh, uh, and and a little inferior. And then as I got to know them better, I realized I was a lot happier than they were, <laughs> and I didn't want their life. I wanted my life. I wanted my mind. It's important to consider how valuable it is to be happy. I mean, the, the, the science of, of the, the, the study of happiness concludes that happy people, they just do better at everything. You know, not only do they feel better, you know, but, but they achieve it at a higher level, they have better relationships, they live longer, they're healthier. In our chapter on happiness, we talk about the, the model of happiness that was developed by Martin Seligman, who was the founder of the field of positive psychology that studies, studies happy people as opposed to misery, you know, and... and uh, but from, from a scientific point of view, he says you can summarize what makes people happy with the acronym PERMA, P-E-R-M-A. And the P is positive emotion. It's deep engagement, that flow experience of being completely passionately engaged in what you're doing. It's relationships, that's the R. The M is meaning. And the A is accomplishment or achievement. And so the accomplishment or achievement is not trivial, it's 20%. But it's 20 percent. It's not it's not 90 percent. And so many young people grow up thinking that it's 90 percent. So what I think parents can do is talk with kids about this stuff and talk about your own life and, and to talk, talk about the things that uh, you do in your own life to elevate your positive emotion. You know, I, 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 I'm really working on getting to bed earlier so that, that you know, I, my, my mood's better if, if I get enough sleep or exercise or meditate or whatever it is. Let kids know how valuable they are to you. You're the, you're the most important things in my life. Let them know how important friendships are to you. And let, let them know how much you value your kids' friendships. And talk to them about the things in life that feel meaningful to you, whether it's your work or whether it's volunteering or whether it's engagement with a church or synagogue. And also, you know, to talk about the fact that, that, that achievement can, can, be, can be fulfilling. So I think talking about, talking about happiness with the goal of, of becoming increasingly happy, it, it just makes sense to me uh, because happiness is so good for virtually everything. I absolutely love what you say. It's such a great model that parents and kids, everybody can really get a lot of uh, insight and value from. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate all that you've had to share with us. There's so much that we can all learn from you. I really enjoyed it, Mackenzie. Thank you. Ready for today's takeaways? Here are the three things from my conversation with Dr. Sixrude that will help you take the 100 pound weight off your kid's neck. Number one, take an honest look at the expectations you have for your child. Do they communicate conditional love or approval? Are they controlling? Do they communicate excessive pressure to excel? Do they imply that there's only one path to a successful future? Write them down and consider if they are healthy or toxic. Number two, talk with your child to see if they're feeling expectations that are weighing them down. Find a good time to connect and ask them and be willing to listen, empathize, and apologize if needed. And number three, help your child develop a healthy growth mindset. 
Help your child to think of their intelligence as a gift, not a burden, and to focus on finding happiness in life by putting forth effort in things they love to do. And for all your friends who can relate, tell them about Gifted Minds. Check us out on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review. Let's go crush this week. Thanks for listening. If you'd like more parenting tips and advice, please follow us on your favorite podcast platform.